by Chemistry. Hi everyone and welcome to Brought to You by Chemistry. What's brought to you by Chemistry? I hear you ask. Complicated reactions, complicated exams, even more complicated romances? Yes. And as well as that, it's a new podcast series from the Royal Society of Chemistry. So you see the branding, branding all links together. Yeah, we've thought about this. My name is Dr. Alex Lathbridge. And in this series, we're taking a look at plastics, bringing together experts from inside and outside the chemistry world to help us understand the ins and outs of all things plastic. Now, plastics are, of course, a valuable resource, no doubt about that. But plastics aren't necessarily fantastic when you think about how we've used them, especially when it comes to the environment. Now, in a recent survey, the RSC found that people in the UK are often concerned about their plastic consumption, with nearly half saying that they avoid buying items wrapped in plastic packaging when possible. So, of course, for a series about plastic, Let's jump right into episode one and get rid of it all together. Yep, gone. Say bye-bye. Can you imagine that? All right. What would that world look like? Do you think it could ever happen? And more importantly, would it actually be a good thing? Of course, dear listener, we're going to need some actual experts in the subject because I don't know. And if you know, it wouldn't really work because the way this goes out, you'd be forward in time. Sound doesn't travel back in time. So to help us explore these questions, we've got Tom Welton, Professor of Sustainable Chemistry at Imperial College London and President of the Royal Society of Chemistry as well as science, natural history, and environmental broadcaster, Liz Bonin. Yeah, we good? We we like that little intro. That's quite nice, isn't it? Got us all in the mood. Totally in the mood now. Let's do this. Yeah, ready to go. So my first question is to you, Tom. What actually is plastic, like from a chemical, like molecular point of view? And why is it so hard to get rid of it from our lives? Okay, so I mean, so really not what is, what are plastics? There's lots of plastics, different ones. What they have in common is they're made up of things we call polymers. So that's long chains of repeat units again and again and again and again. So you have these monomers, which are the little repeat units from which the polymer is made and you make these very, very long chains. That gives you materials with a whole range of material properties from, you know, the kind of plastic my desk is made of, which is really quite solid. You can hear the rack to the plastic that you might have um, in a water bottle or something like that, which is really quite soft and flexible, even more flexible than that. So we have a range of materials that are made up of polymers, but each one of them has been kind of landed upon a combination of, it provides a material property that we want, um, and it can be made easily in, you know, in an industrial process, usually starting off from some kind of oil derivative, um, monomer, chemical, that gets polymerized, makes your polymer, and then we use them around us. Why are they so widely used? Because, well, because they've been designed to be so, (laughs) is, is one of the answers to that. But because they have this, you know, between them, they have this huge range of, of properties from, you know, things you can use to hold up a building through to things that you can use to wrap around a wire, Um, or make a drinks bottle out of. And so that's why they're all over the place. I mean, you know, like you're saying, they are so ubiquitous. Like, you can't turn around and not see a plastic. Like, plastics are everywhere. So, Liz, now thinking about that, right, what are some examples that you've seen in your work of harms that have been caused by plastics? Because for me, when I think plastic, I don't think it's, like, super fantastic. I think of all the all the issues with waste and whatnot. Like, what kind of examples have you seen of harms? Well, we certainly learned that there are problems with plastic, despite the fact that it was hailed as this, you know, brilliant new material that was um, just so useful for so many purposes. But I think what it boils down to is is how we produce and how we consume that plastic has created a, an environmental crisis. And a couple of years ago, I set off to investigate how much plastics are impacting um, our planet. So some of the things I've seen, um, well, with regards to wildlife, first of all, 
plastic is impacting wildlife on the land and in the oceans. One of the most difficult um, things that I've witnessed were in sort of the most far reaching areas of our planet. So a really remote island called, called Lord Howe, where Shearwater uh, parents are feeding their chicks inadvertently um, with plastic, so much so that every year in April, scientists have to flush out the chick's stomachs before the chicks embark on their, their maiden voyage, their maiden migration. And I witnessed, you know, 60 pieces of plastic coming out of this little three-month-old chick. Um, dead shearwaters are found on the beaches the next morning, and as many as 260 pieces of plastic uh, was found in one of them. That equates to about 10 kilograms of plastic in a human stomach. So what was really happening was how pervasive this was in, in our um, marine environments, but also how far reaching it was getting. Um, another example is the Arctic, one of the most presumed uh, remote, pristine parts of our planet now has the highest, one of the highest concentrations of microplastics on the planet and the microplastics have infiltrated the entire food web from zooplankton, little tiny crustaceans that are fed on by fish that are then fed on by, you know, seals and then polar bears, or humans also, you know, through the eating fish and eating seals. So that was quite a, a, um, a stark realization of just how far reaching the plastic problem um, had become. We also witnessed pollution like I'd never imagined I'd see, uh, you know, rafts of, of dirty plastic waste, uh, often a mile long, flowing down rivers in Indonesia. Um, and we mistakenly think that this is a problem of developing countries, but actually we send a lot of our plastic to these countries, Indonesia, Malaysia, we were sending it to China. The UK is now was sending its dirty plastic to um, Turkey. They've just banned that. And now we're scratching our heads, wondering where to you know, send that waste. So there's pollution on a scale that I, I is just staggering, um, which led us to realize there is a bit of a recycling myth going on. No country in the world has adequate infrastructure to recycle this stuff. It's building up on these illegal dump sites in countries that we're sending it to. You know, it, it's just, it's a massive, much more massive problem than I thought. And just very quickly to mention two other things that we never set out to investigate or realize was part of the problem is the impact of plastic on human health. So we're ingesting a lot of this plastic through the seafood that we eat. We're also inhaling a lot of it. And at the first plastic health summit in Amsterdam, um, I did a urine test and found I had uh, bisphenols and phthalates in my urine, which are three of which are on the European Chemicals Agency list of substances of very high concern and they're endocrine disruptors. So they are related to um, cancers, hormone mediated cancers. They're also toxic to reproduction. So human health is being impacted in ways that we are only beginning to scratch the surface of, beginning to understand. And lastly, I would say the damage that I've witnessed or I've learned about is is that on climate change. Plastic production has a huge impact on our warming planet at every stage of its production. 99% of plastics are made from fossil fuels at the manufacturing stage as a huge carbon footprint, but also at the end of life. So if it's incinerated or it's an, it's an, it ends up in our oceans, the oceans can't then perform as the carbon sinks they're very good at being. So there's just multi-layered impacts um, when it comes to plastic, particularly the 50% of plastic that's single use that we produce in vast amounts and that we sort of consume and then throw away um, very, very quickly. So obviously there are huge problems. Like you say, it's multi-layered. You know, it's not just how we think about recycling. It's also health. It's also climate change. Now, did that sort of surprise you when you did that urine test and you found out that you had all of these different uh, plastics or these different compounds inside you was it worrying scary do you know when I was asked to do it I knew that they would be in my system I knew enough about the problem then um and yet when I saw it in the result it was pretty upsetting and I spoke about it at that at the, at the health summit where scientists are finding out that um in laboratory experiments, they're finding that um, microplastics can uh, get into the fetus. It affects our immune cells. Immune cells die three times qu more quickly in the presence of microplastics. You know, what staggers me, actually, Alex, is that despite what we're beginning to understand, despite people like me shouting from the rooftops, a lot of other journalists did the same tests and, you know, wrote articles and were on radio programs talking about it, we are still not paying the attention that is warranted to this massive problem. You would almost argue some people don't really fully understand 
that the health of the ocean really is so crucial to our health. Even if you argue, well, look, your health is directly being impacted by this. Now, will you listen and pay attention? We're still not quite collectively as a global community um, acting as we should. And the crisis is only getting worse. So yeah, it, it was worrying. I, I expected it. it. It upset me, but more upsetting is the fact that we're still not doing anything about it. Tom, with that in mind, I mean, well, actually, this is for both of you, but I'm going to start with Tom. Do you think that plastics actually have any part to play in a truly sustainable future? Because from what Liz has sort of spoken about, it seems that they might be, I don't know, it seems to me that there might be more harm than they're worth, right? More bad than good. So the, so the answer to the question, do I think that um, they have a role to play in a sustainable future is absolutely yes. But what I would say also is that I agree with every word that Liz has just said, you know, and so for me, the question isn't, are they, uh, can plastics be in, our, in a sustainable future? But if we do not make our use of plastics sustainable, we will not have a sustainable future. And so it's really, how do we achieve that is the question I'm asking myself, not whether, you know, whether I can imagine a world without plastics and that world being sustainable, you know, 80% 80, 80 of the non-fuel products of oil, so the bits that we don't burn in our, in our cars, 80% of it ends up as plastics. It's huge. You know, that is more than the rest of all the chemicals put together, it's considerably more. And so I do find it really difficult to imagine a world without polymeric compounds in it. But that world has to be sustainable. It has to be. Otherwise, we go down the pan. Our plastic use has to be made sustainable. So not can it be, it has to be. So therefore, how are we going to do it? Okay, Liz, what are your thoughts? Do you think that plastics like have any role to play in a well and truly sustainable future? It's a it's an interesting question, obviously, and a, and a loaded one, and, and one that I hope we, we're going to we're going to unravel a little bit more um, as we continue the discussion. But as it stands at the moment, um, nothing about plastic production and consumption, particularly when we're thinking about this fifty plus percent of you know single use, use once, throw away plastic packaging, nothing about the way it's produced and consumed fits into the narrative of a sustainable future mm -hmm. where you know 99% as I mentioned before 99% of plastics are made from fossil fuels that's a finite resource we know the problem with extracting natural resources from our finite planet um, the production of virgin plastic is set to increase from 400 million tons to 800 million tons in 20 years the graph is still going up very rapidly and that is incredibly worrying obviously and you know to date of the 8.3 billion tons of plastic that's been produced something like 91 percent has never been sort of repurposed i, I don't want to say recycling recycled because that's a, another loaded term that we will hopefully unravel and 76 percent of it ends up as waste so with those kinds of stats understanding that recycling infrastructure is non-existent on the planet to to cope with that amount of plastic waste at the moment as it stands, I would say no. Um, but then to kind of look into the future, as Tom mentioned, and, and, and to discuss making plastic sustainable, that is a difficult um, thing to, to imagine. And personally, from what I've learned as a you know, bi biologist reluctant to have to learn about you know, the economy and the way we, we run our systems in the West and, and actually across the globe, you know, because oftentimes, even when we're looking at the issue of recycling, a lot of the discussions are about, well, is there a market for it? And is, that's why like, there's no market for it. So therefore it goes to Turkey. That in itself is the problem. It, it, there needs to be a, a more, a deeper change with how we live on this planet. So that's really interesting because you know it, it touched on like economics and human behavior and stuff. But I think to take it back to, you know, the, the what I said right at the top, and I suppose this is, you've sort of covered this. Tom, do you think that there would ever be a way for us to completely stop using plastics like to completely remove them from global like our life right now they're so ubiquitous could that could that happen so there were obviously there was a time before plastics and so it, it is in, it is it, possible you know god i'm trying to think 
do I, you know, my lifetime, I knew people who remembered the world before plastics. I don't think, I don't think I do, you know, my mum's 85, plastics had happened by the time she was born. But, you know, my grandparents knew the world before plastics and lived in it perfectly well, um, maybe not as well as we do now. So it is imaginable, but I just can't see how we're going to get there and whether we would actually want to, you know, the, the right plastics in the right places would be preferable to alternatives. So, so we've already touched upon, um, you know, global warming and, and climate change. And yes, it is true that the amount of energy that goes into the production of plastics is huge. But if you were to replace, you know, all the plastic bottles in the world with glass bottles, you know, the amount of the energy demand of that would be even greater, you know, than the, the amount of energy that goes into a, into a gram of making a gram of glass is much higher than the amount of energy that goes into um, making a gram of plastic. And the weight of a glass bottle is much greater than the, you know. So, you know, so Liz mentioned that less than 10% of plastics ever been made, um, have ever been repurposed, recycled. Even more shocking than that, I think it's down in about 10% of those that have been recycled twice. You know, it seems to me that, that there, are, there are places where you're more likely to find success, as it were. She's quite right, the recycling system does not function well, but getting the recycling system to, to function in a way, the repurposing system to, refun to function in a way where we're not desperately scrambling for things to be recycled twice, we're thinking of them being recycled a hundred times. My view is that the contribution that I can make is more likely to have a positive impact on that than it is on the other ways in which in which society might change. And I, you know, what I said, do you know that there was a moment that my heart absolutely broke that, you know, for decades we've been saying we need to consume, we need to consume less, we need to be more thoughtful about what the products that we have. And I, rem I remember it really particularly seeing the first advert that I ever saw for a plug-in air freshener. And I, you know, just really, we're in this world where we're looking at, at how we can reduce our impact on the environment, somebody has designed this. I feel my contribution to getting a sustainable plastics economy is likely to have greater impact on getting recyclability to be better than it is on, I, I kind of, I give up on the plug-in air fresheners. <laughs> you know what, I, because I came into this, again, I'm, I'm very, I try and be as plastic free as possible, he says with a plastic bottle in front of him. But I didn't want to point that out. Yeah, I know, I know. It's <laughs> sort of that, oh, we need to make society better. Curious, you live in society. Hmm. I was hoping uh, it was made out of, you know, sugar cane or... <laughs> Olive, no. olive seeds or, um, you know. No, no, no. I, I only eat sugar cane. I only <laughs> <laughs> make stuff out of it. But I mean, Tom, on that, can you give an examples of how plastics have actually benefited society there? Because I think that ties in nicely to what I'm going to ask Liz later. There are examples of great good. You know, this computer in front of me would not be here without plastics. This telephone in front would not be here without plastics. You know, the you know, the clothing that I'm wearing, although I think I'm wearing a 100% cotton shirt, I can tell you that a lot of this thread is not cotton. Around me, you know, the, the door that's in front of me is, you know, that's coated with a paint which was actually, well, is plastic, you know, polymers in liquid formula around me again and again. You know, although, although packaging can be terribly wasteful, packaging can be hugely preserving. The pills that I took this morning, which had a polymer coating, the, you know, there's a whole range of things that plastics have really enhanced our lives. And, and like I say, so for me, it's like, how can we achieve those positives without causing the negatives? Okay, so 
with that then, um, I'm again thinking of all the things plasticky this morning that have helped me. Um, you know, I'm looking at this this voice recorder. I'm looking at the microphone. I'm looking at my computer. I'm thinking about all the pills that you know, my vitamin D supplements. Like, yeah, I think I kind of we all plastics are everywhere. So, I guess, Liz, how do you think that humans? need to change their behavior or behaviors in order to reduce or eliminate the harms from plastics. I mean, from individuals all the way up to government, I guess, because we're all humans in that. We're all humans, right? It's not just about individual behavior. It's it's not just about industry. It's not just about policymakers. It's everybody. Um, and, you know, I do, uh, when I have a chance to rant about plastics in some talks, I always hail the fact that plastics have been really useful for all sorts of things that you've mentioned and MRI machines and aeronautics engineering, you know. So it's not just about focusing on the 50% that is, you know, single use. We have to think about how that plastic at its end of its life is repurposed also. But we know that the major problem is the single use. So when it comes to changing behaviors as a global community i suppose it starts at industry level we've gone around the houses about sort of how to clean up the environment of plastic there's a there's an alliance this is one of my favorite things i like to talk about there's a, a an organization called the alliance to end plastic waste which is made up of 30 member companies some of them are some of the largest petrochemical companies in the world so we're talking dow chemical exxon mobil and then consumer goods manufacturers like procter and gamble and they all um, pledge to contribute $1.5 billion to clean up the environment of plastic, but nowhere on their website or on what they hail to be doing is there talk of stopping this production that's set to increase, you know, double in 20 years. And it's interesting because a lot of those petrochemical companies are singly investing 10 billion each in new petrochemical companies to turn the fossil fuel byproducts into more plastic. So I think at the very top of the tree of this global community change that has to happen has to be industry we have to turn off the plastic tap at the source period and we know very well that the, the reason why production is doubling um in the next 20 years is because you know of the way our system is set up profit gdp money fossil fuels you know continue to just make profits out of extracting these finite resources from the ground. So industry level obviously at policy level now so far around the world governments have instigated some bans on certain plastic products, single use plastic products, like, you know, cotton buds and plastic cutlery and plates. But really that's only decreased the amount of plastic entering the ocean by something like 7%. And we're talking, there's about 9.1 million tons entering our oceans still every day, uh, sorry, a year <laughs> um, to this day. Um, it's a garbage truck or more. It's about a garbage truck and a half now every single minute. Okay, so that change at policy level hasn't really made mm -hmm. a massive to the problem and then at individual level absolutely change your toothbrush to a bamboo one i've changed my dental floss i always use a reusable bottle um for my water and my coffee now it's become a habit um but even those simple things i noticed you moving your your water bottle away um even those simple things i notice when people are queuing up at coffee shops at the moment they're not even doing that so as much as I think sometimes the onus is placed too much on the on the general public to make a change, you know, we can't change the world without helping to force industry and then policymakers to change too. And we can do that by making our voices heard. But at a behavioral level, I don't think we're still getting it. And we're reverting to just using single use plastic bottles to take away coffee cups. I mean, come on. We can at least start doing that. Plastic audits are great. There was this great initiative in a school um, where you go home and you do a simple bar chart of, of what your waste is every month. You know, is it mostly food packaging? Is it, is it mostly toiletries? Is it, is it mostly stationary for school supplies? And then whatever the, whichever bar is the highest, you, you focus on that the following month and you reduce your use. So that's, all those things are really useful. But more than that, I think what's become very clear is that we can make our voices heard by writing to our MPs, literally a template letter that you keep on sending until they stop exporting their plastic waste to another country that has no waste management infrastructure, right? And also investing in energy companies that are not fossil fuel based will make a massive difference because don't forget, plastics are fossil fuels. It's all, it's one and the same thing. Or investing in a bank that doesn't invest in petrochemical companies. All of those things are really easy and simple to do. If we could achieve that across the board, you know, from public individual behavior to sort of putting pressure on 
industry and governments to governments actually stepping up. I mean, Costa Rica is moving ahead with really thriving, you know, striving to ban all single use plastics. Meanwhile, the UK is still debating bottle deposit return schemes. The oceans knows no borders. There's no point one country doing lots and the other, you know, not doing enough. The plastic will get everywhere. So I think there has to be, I mean, there's been a call for a, a, a sort of a Paris agreement for plastics. And I think it's long overdue. But what I question, and I don't know how to crack that nut, is that despite some countries, including the UK, the public were really vocal about it, really calling for change, shocked at what they were seeing. The change is still not happening between the big industry and, and policy making levels. And I'm not sure. As a communicator, I'm still trying to understand how to crack that nut. So, you know, I, I agree with Liz that it's, it's, you know, in the it's, it's a many, many layered level thing, whatever you want to express it listeners here might be aware of, I would imagine everybody's heard about the IPCC. You know, we know about the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. The many people will know that there's IPBES as well, if that's how it's pronounced, which is about the same kind of thing, the International Panel on Biodiversity. And there isn't one on chemicals in the environment. And it's, a, you know, and it's, to me, it's, obvious that why why does not just plastics but chemicals in the environment never get the same kind of attention as climate change which you know I'm not saying it's not you know I'm obviously not saying that it's not an important thing but why does it not get the same attention as climate change biodiversity loss there's a thing missing that you know they call it the science policy interface and you know, and actually, the, I can tell you, the RSC is is working towards there being the equivalent of the uh, IPCC and IPBES for chemicals in the environment, because and you know, it is a necessary precursor. It, in in and of itself, it wouldn't it won't change anything, but it is a necessary precursor to getting onto the agenda with the same amount of weight as these other issue, other environmental issues have been, ha have, have been having. And so that's, you know, that's hugely important. Of course, industry, you know, the, the, you know, the people that, that produce all of the products that we buy and use are, you know, the various different industries, you know, and there's, for me, there's a whole range of things to be done. Yeah, there are, you know, there's stuff out there that for God's sake, let's just stop having it. You know, of course there is. But then there's also this stuff out there that we absolutely need, you know, and we do need to look at, for me, I, I guess the word is appropriate in that when I think about how these various different things that are currently made from the plastics that they're currently made from, how, how they are used, how I interact with them as just a consumer, and just like I need there to be different material properties, I kind of need there to be different, as it were, environmental properties. There are some things that I just think, do you know what? My ideal plastic for that, my ideal, my ideal for material for that will biodegrade. And then there'll be other things that I'll say, well, actually, oh God, no, the last thing I want is for for that to suddenly start biodegrading halfway through using it. What I need for that to be is, you know, recyclable and actually recycled. And so I need, I need a, a, redesign, a redesign of the, mod, I, I need a redesign of the products because one of the problems with, with recycling is that we don't have products made of just one thing. <laughs> You know, they're complex mixtures of materials themselves. They might have multiple different um, plastics within them that are then, you know, those composites are different, difficult to separate. One, I need to think, do I need this product? Plugging there, fresh, no. You know, there are other ones that I don't need. Do I need this product? No. Do I need this product? Yes. Then what, how do I need this product to be? I need this product to not only be able to provide the function I want it to, to, to provide, but I need it to be designed so that if it's 
something that should be recycled. It's designed so that it can be recycled technically straightforwardly, but also that me as a consumer, uh, that I, you know, the part that I have to play in that is something I can achieve without, you know, having to dedicate my life to that recycling itself. You know, it needs to be something that I can do in my ordinary life. That requires, that will require different materials. That will also require a kind of molecular redesign as well as a, an object redesign. And these are, you know, these are huge tasks that I'm not claiming for one minute are going to be easy. But they, if, for me, that's kind of how I kind of think about, I don't, I'm, I'm gonna use the word hierarchy because my English isn't good enough to know the other word, but a sort of hierarchy of decision-making about those different things in order to get me to the place where I need to be, which is a sustainable use of plastics to enable me to live in a sustainable world. And that kind of plays into Tom, um, what I've been very interested in as a result of sort of uh, my understanding now of how we produce and consume not just plastics, but just everything that we use, even you know the food we produce, how we mm. consume that. And it, it, it's about you know the argument of making plastic sustainable, but also any material sustainable, but also how we behave with that material. So for example, when you mentioned glass earlier on, may arguably have a higher carbon footprint because of how it's, you know, has to be transported because it's heavier. You know, for me, um, and Alex, when you were asking about, you know, solutions at every level, I forgot to really mention one of the most important, which is about re refilling, just changing the way we, we, we are changing our relationship with these materials and, and their purpose and simplifying things down to, well, yes, this thing was made from glass, but I will use it for the rest of my life. And therefore its carbon footprint is, is drastically reduced and not at all comparable to that of plastic. So that's, I think, is a really important point to, to make when it comes to how we rethink how we do life. And, and it kind of leads me to one of the most exciting parts of all of this, this whole story, which you could apply to climate change, to meat production, to agriculture, to, to, to fast, the fashion industry, um, even though today we're talking about plastics, and that is how we were living in a, a linear degenerative economy. We still are. So it's an economy and a system whereby we look at how much money can I extract from this natural resource and then how much financial value can I take from it before throwing it away? And many economists, which again, biologists, no idea about you know, economics, but had to sort of, okay, dip my toe in and try and understand. What was really heartening was economists are beginning to, to, to have that conversation about how we can redesign the economy so that we don't live in a linear degenerative one, we live in a circular one, right? And mm. that means, how can I produce a product, whether it be some amount of plastic you, for, you, for, I would argue, long-term use, not single use, how can I make it in such a way that it benefits society and the natural world? In, in other words, it doesn't have the, these toxic chemicals that are just, hey, it's cheaper to make it this way, adding, bung in these chemicals because we save money and you know, all of that nonsense, really mindfully producing anything going forward in a way that benefits society and the natural world. And then, I came across, um, there is actually a Turkish company that's making a material, a plastic slash material out of olive seeds, okay? And it's a perfect example of how it's using something from a different industry where there's a waste product that you don't know what to do with, the seeds of the olive, and you make a plastic slash polymer material out of it. And that is absolutely what these economists and industry and business leaders are talking about. It's not just circular economy within one industry, it's about what my waste product can do to serve another industry and, and so that we no longer extract anything new from the earth. We just simply reuse and repurpose um, across all sectors of society. And for me, that's the most exciting part of this conversation about the problem with plastic. It's there is a way to do this. If we don't prioritize profit and GDP, which is a complete, it, it's, it's not the right measure of a country's success and I think we can all agree to that now you know it doesn't take into account how much you're extracting in order to, to be successful at just selling and buying you know um, if we focus on that I think that's where we're going to crack the problem with plastics and and a lot of the other systemic issues that are creating our environmental problems and threatening our very survival on this planet 
Wonderful. And so with that, you know, I'm coming out and the first thing, look, you said a lot, both of you said a lot, but the only thing I really heard there was olive seed plastic, <laughs> because that's really amazing. Like I have sort of become, I guess I'm ambivalent towards olives now. Um, and the seeds, are obviously the worst bit followed second <laughs> by the flesh. So the fact that we can... <laughs> The flavour. <laughs> and now, the do fact neither that... of you love olives? No, they're okay. <laughs> I'm shocked and horrified. They're okay. We we can't oh. be friends, I'm afraid. <laughs> Please don't tell ten year old me I can't be friends with Lisbon and okay. Oh no, you're being too nice. Okay, Alfred. Uh, uh, I see. I just I'm obsessed with olives. You know when they say don't trust anyone who doesn't like animals or food. If you don't like olives, I'm gonna mistrust you a little bit. Okay, I love olives. So, uh, um, <laughs> speaking of olive seeds, or is it plastic. Paula Paula Grady calls them the devil's hemorrhoids? Doesn't it? Guys, come on, back on topic. Back on topic. <laughs> oh no, don't oh. put me off olives. Plastic podcast. Plastic podcast. Let's All get right, back plastics. to it. Let's get back. You, know, you spoke there about something really interesting. You know, hmm. taking the waste from one area and putting it into this idea of a more sort of globally circular economy, at least in terms of industry. So olive seed plastic. Now that seems like a, a scientific, like a great achievement. So Tom, with that in mind, apart from like the science policy interface that you were talking about, I mean, what are scientists doing to help solve the plastics problem? Well, olive seeds themselves, no, but that's actually part of my research. And um, woody biomass is the stuff. So you, you'd have heard, people have, will have heard about biomass. And, and they would have heard about, you know, sugar being used to make fuel and then the debate of, oh, hang on, you, you, what about the food fuel debate? And, and so this, uh, there's this whole thing called second generation biomass. What it's about is exactly those olive seeds. It's about the bit of the plant that you don't eat. And so, you know, what are those bits of plant made up from? They're made of what we call lignocellulosic biomass which is a bit of a mouthful. What, it, what that is, is, is three polymers, cellulose, which is sort of when you, when you see a plant starting to grow and it's very green, you know, what you're seeing is a lot of cellulose. And then as it sort of browns and turns woody, you're starting to see another polymer, which is called lignin. And then they're sort of stuck together by yet another polymer called hemicellulose. And there's huge research interest, you know, we do it in our group, but there's huge interest across the world of how we can use these three biopolymers to be source materials for chemicals and fuel. And yeah, and, and that is very much one of the things that, you know, so we're interested in that whole, whether we can unmix the three polymers and then mix them again in ways in which they provide a, a range of material properties rather than, you know, wood is wood is wood is wood is wood. And this is what wood is good at, but, but trying to, and so that, that is a huge area of research. Pe you know, people will know about biodegradable things. So there's, you know, for instance, there's a, a material called agricultural mulch film. You might have seen, you know, sheets of plastic spread over, over fields with plants growing through holes in it. And it has some great advantages. It allows you to be very precise in the delivery of your agrochemicals to the plant and not to just spread them everywhere because, you know, it's covering the ground, you know. And historically, that, that was made out of polyethylene, which, you know, breaks down to, to um, microplastics in the soil, degrades the soil, it's long term you know, its long-term effect on the soil is not good at all. And so many manufacturers have moved to, um, you know, replacing that with biodegradable mulch film made, you know, from a biodegradable plastic, which, you know, is much, much, much better. But biodegradability annoys me in many ways, but the, the, one, the way that it annoys me most is we only measure it by amount. We don't measure it by what it becomes. And we, you know, and we kind of think what's good is what's called total mineralization. So all the carbon becomes carbon um, dioxide. But, you know, couldn't you imagine having a version of agricultural mulch film that when it biodegraded, it actually biodegraded into something that enhanced the health of the soil? For me, that is what a truly but a truly sustainable plastic 
I feel as though what you said so far, first things first, uh, lignocellulosic uh, biomass sounds... Well done. I would much rather have that in my mouth than <laughs> olives, first things first. I guess the most salient point here, I guess my question to both of you, this is, if we're changing the things that are going into these plastics, like we're making them out of repurposed material, you know, better polymers or, or better, you know, um, like the fundamental ingredients of these plastics are getting better and better. Why aren't we calling it something else? Because the term plastic, plastics is yeah. so heavily tainted with this idea of, I guess, difficulty in, in being repurposed, actually being a problem. People think plastics, they think problems. So if we're making so much of a change, why don't we call it something else? That would help people. That would help someone like me. A lot of these are called bioplastics yeah. um, uh, so far. There's not a lot on the market yet, no. is, is there, Tom? It, there's no, a lot no, of conversations no, no. about it. It's there really are, much more recent. I mean, there is some stuff creeping onto market. It's much more recent. It's a slow it process. Oh, yeah. Uh, I would potentially argue that part of the problem that, you know, part of the reason why it's such a slow process is because of the things we've been talking about, you know, sort of mm. being tied to a system that... Um, you know, prioritizes profit above all else. So some of these materials are called bioplastics already, and they're hailed as, you know, biodegradable or compostable. And, and, and that's complicated because not all bioplastics at the moment are, you know, biodegradable in the sense that you can just bung them on your compost heap and they'll just disappear in a couple of days. Most of them at the moment are need to be industrially composted. Yeah. That so adds to another level of problems here. There's a lot of companies have gone for sort of the quick fix. Again, ironically, going for some chemical additives that create a problem with the material. It might make it more durable, but arguably it's because it's made more quickly and more cheaply. So then it cannot be truly biodegraded. It has to be composted and it can't be composted in your back garden. And in the UK, for example, there are very there are a limited number of comp industrial composting facilities, and a lot of them are are refusing those types of materials. They're only accepting food because of the market and how much money they can make. So it, it's not quite as simple yet. We don't have all of these alternative materials. I mean, I came across a fabulous young man in Indonesia called David Christian and his company is called EvoWare. And he makes something that is completely 100% biodegradable, but it can only package a limited number of things. Mind you, it would make a massive difference to say the hotel industry because it wraps say, you know, those single use um, soaps that are normally in a plastic wrapper and then they're in a plastic laminated box. But this material dissolves in underwater. So can you imagine how much of a difference that would make to all the single use, you know, plastic little wrappers that are wrapped around all your things in your hotel room. Um, it's great for like um, instant coffee sachets because you just put it in the hot water. It doesn't taste of uh, seaweed um, and so yes he's making this material from seaweed and it's entirely beautifully made uh, you know biodegradable no toxic chemicals whatsoever and he did this with just two colleagues out of his you know living room um, and you know he's doing this in a in one of the places that is most impacted by what we sell to them and is, and is very polluted because okay they don't have infrastructure themselves for recycling and waste management but also we send a lot we sell a lot of our stuff to them in the west you know all the single use sachets from, from unilever and procter and gamble to those countries so for somebody that young to kind of take it upon himself to find a solution i think is just amazing now there are again even with something as amazing as that there is a, a question mark over farming the seaweed to produce the material you know at scale could create ecosystem issues on the coastlines where you're growing the seaweed so it kind of comes back full circle to what i keep on harping on about it's how much how much material do we really need for single use packaging and do we really need to fundamentally think about a paradigm shift in how we use things and decide to just sort of refill for the things we can refill as opposed to want that kind of easy um lifestyle that we've been told we want at the cost of the planet people often get really <laughs> hung up on <laughs> this idea of single-use plastics and they they kind of demonize them and even myself i think single-use plastics are bad you know i think of like soaps in hotels like you were talking about you know i think of all the ways they're used kind of terribly but at the same time you know i know of people who have accessibility issues who um need single-use plastics you know people who need um who are buying food like cucumbers and whatnot and need to have them last um a long time so i guess is there is there an issue that single-use plastics gets get um, demonized 
and people don't think too much of their sometimes their their positive uses i don't know what are your thoughts there Liz i think and Tom? that's a really good um an important question and actually i remember posting a photograph of these chopped up vegetables you know that were wrapped in plastic packaging and there it was an onion and a carrot and a, and, and a piece of celery you know that arguably can all come without any packaging at all chopped up you know, all laid up in this supermarket and saying, you know, is this really necessary? And rightfully so, I got that response. So there are people who need that. And I don't, I think that's a very valid point. I think that there is an answer to that, that is a more sustainable version. You know, like every crisis um, that we have caused, it's not going to be a binary situation there's it, there's going to have to be layers of solutions so if there's a place for a better type of material will we call it plastic i don't know i'm going to have to think of that new name alex but what i'm trying to say is those for those people absolutely we need the right kind of packaging can some of that be in a refill form potentially you know i don't i don't necessarily think that we have to revert back to the single use plastic that's causing such a massive problem but whatever the solution is it will be substantial, but in comparison, you know, with the solutions that we will have found by eliminating this single use plastic waste problem, I think that outweighs it in that sense. We can absolutely find solutions, think outside the box and sort that issue out, but it's not at the cost of sort of not saying, turn off the plastic tap at the source and stop making single use plastic. Does that make sense? It makes fantastic sense. Tom, what do you think? Yeah, I'd bring you back to that hierarchy thing I still haven't thought of a better word for for it that I was talking about earlier but you know do you know do we need this do I do I want this function in my life um no well do you know what don't have it then you know <laughs> but yes okay I do need this function okay what do I need the material properties of the thing providing this function to be and also, what do I need? As I said, I, I, I was using the word environmental properties, I, you know, not necessarily, it's not really in the, in the environment, but what other, you know, what other properties, what sustainability properties do I need this material to have? Do I need it to be, you know, a, yeah, a refill, something that I can go back and refill again and again and again and, and, and reuse, not recycle, just reuse. Is it something like that? Is it something that, I need it to be recyclable and re actually recycled in systems that function well to enable that re um, recycling. Is it genuinely that the thing that I'm using this thing for is genuinely has to be single use? And if it genuinely has to be single use, then what does that mean? What, what do I need that thing to be? And then I need that thing to be something that will, again, easily in a way that i can achieve it maybe be biodegradable wonderful well you know we've come now it's it's we've come now to the end um and the, i think the one thing that i'm thinking about is if scientists could in fact make a little tupperware thing that i could put stew in and continually put like stew in and not like when you wash it the first time it has that orange film that never quite goes away <laughs> That would be really great. Yeah, yeah. Like it's fine, but like aesthetically, it doesn't fit in with my future color scheme. How do you feel wife. about glass tupper Tupperware? It's really good, but it's really heavy. Um, but it it does have yeah. some of the same issues when you have the plastic top. I bought so many of them from IKEA, and I accidentally dropped one, and it doesn't shatter in a way that you hope. It shatters like really difficultly. <laughs> All right, for people listening, for both of you, I mean. What is the one key thing that you'd like them to take away from this? I'm going to start with you, Liz, because you seem like a font of great ideas. Oh, it's all smoke and mirrors. Um, I suppose, sadly... Are those um, mirrors made out of plastic? plastic <laughs> of course grass? not. Okay, what good. Just checking. Just checking. Um, listen, we're going through a, a really tough time at the moment, and I am loath to be you know, the voice of, of doom, but I, I also think that sometimes it's, it's uncomfortable to navel gaze and to really take a long, hard look at sort of where, where the world is going and how, our role, the role that we play in it. Um, but the sad truth is that this problem has not gone away. It's getting worse. Um, despite the fact that, you know, we, the, the awareness was raised to such a level back in 2018, 2019, it hasn't gone away. And so I think, 
I think we just need to stare it in the face and pull up our socks and think about what we as individuals can do um, to make a difference. And that is think about refill, metal Tupperware, if you don't like glass, um, think about investing in energy companies that don't invest in fossil fuel, that don't use, you know, uh, um, finite resources think about where you invest your money just just make the change and then you'll probably sleep better at night anyway because you know you've done your best in the words of eldridge cleaver one of the black panthers fighting for human rights back in the day um if if you're not part of the you know there's no neutrality anymore if you're not part of the solution you're going to be part of the problem and i remind myself of that every day at the end of the day sometimes it's easier to just look away and not think about our oceans choking on plastic. There's so much going on. You know, we've lost loved ones through this pandemic. It has been a really hard time, but I have a responsibility to give back to the planet that gives me with so much. And so I'm going to live by that. I don't want to be the problem. I want to be part of the solution, no matter how small those changes I make in my life are. Tom, Liz is really with it. She quoted the Black Panthers. I mean, you got oh, it, right? Oh my. <laughs> Tom, what's your... What's your one key takeaway? We're gonna have to. That's what Paul gonna... says. We're gonna... <laughs> <laughs> I don't think we can. We can't. We can't. We can't We're sashay away. We're and everything else is drag. Um, we can't sashay away from the plastic yeah, problems. What I really... No, but we can't. Do you know what? We can't sashay away from these problems. And and what I would say is, you know, it's really easy to get caught up in a a mindset of this problem is too big for me to have any impact on it. You know, and so don't do that. So do do what you can. Do do your plastics audit at home and, and see what you can get rid of or um, recycle more effectively. Do do buy recycled things. You know, one of the wonderful things about, you know, this last year where we've all had to go online to do our shopping is you can put recycled in the search. And, you know, you can put, oh, I need, you know, I need, I need a new pen, recycled pens. You know, you can you can be part of making a market for the things that are recycled. And, and you might, you know, it might be small, but you're not insignificant. And so, so do the things you can, keep on at it. Yes, do pressurise your, your MP, do, you know, do, do what you can. The other thing that I see is, oh my God, I've made one small mistake. I didn't do, you know, and then the, the pit of despair. And so, you know, giving up trying to do something about it because because you got something wrong or you know you didn't realize that you know forgive yourself <laughs> and yeah and just do what do what you can within the reach that you have oh this is like are we going to edit this episode it's going to be a self-help one i love it i feel so <laughs> gassed i'm really happy at the end um well thank you both so much that was amazing you're very welcome Thank you for your great questions, Alex. That it's was great. Okay. Thank you. Oh, All right. See you Lovely then. Lovely to see you, Alex. Thanks a million. Lovely. Thanks, guys. Right. Thanks very right. much. Thanks for having me. Bye. Thanks for joining us for this week's episode of Brought to You by Chemistry. It was produced by Hiran Joshi and Elizabeth Ratcliffe and presented by me, Dr. Alex Lathbridge. This week's episode was good, right? But next week, it's even better. We've got Ruth Strange from Ethical Consumer Magazine and Charnet Chow from University College London. We'll be learning how scientists work out which materials are worse than others, and the power that consumers have to pressure the plastic economy. If you want to learn a bit more about the RSC and plastics, you can visit rsc.li plastics. See you next time.